How did we go to tw- get to 20? I thought we were, like, low on this list. Well, I'm pretty sure since Kel is not spending attention again, he's just putting shit in. Oh, it's all <laughs> the... Oh, it's all the hardware intrinsic stuff. Because they've had so many different issues for it. Oh, um, luckily those I think are pretty easy. But we should probably talk about our stuff this week. Go to wall. That kind of done at this point, I guess. Oh. Well, the other one was a two-one-two-two, right? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> So that's my first step. <clears throat> Why do I feel like we've done this one? Is this different? Yeah. So David's proposing a change to the, the method we added. Oh, okay. We have a delta with the old change. Uh, we can look up what the current shape looks like. Um, I believe he's uh, the the main thing is rather than accepting the actual buffer to use, uh, he's replaced that last buffer argument with two nullable integers for receive buffer size and send buffer size. So are we going to break people? We're already passing uh, 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 stage for. One. I mean, this is new in this release. I know, but I mean, if we, even if we have to make ASP not start making changes to consume this, that becomes a breaking change. They asked for it, right? Well, David did, but that doesn't necessarily mean David's going to go fix all of ASP net. <laughs> well, the most convenient thing does not. <laughs> Moran would have to agree, of course. Um, I don't understand how this change eliminates buffering. Steve, do you understand? Um, yeah, um, oh, if you pass nulls, it doesn't buffer. Is that the, the idea? I, I believe that is his intent. Uh, I asked in the last conference I asked him to clarify what he expects the behavior to be when nulls are zero and I haven't seen a response. I see. Uh, that, that's my understanding that basically wants to allow for a zero receives so that change ASP.NET to do a zero byte read on the connection to know when there's data available and then only when there's data available um, issue a request to the WebSocket to get the next packet. Um, and he basically wants to eliminate any buffers from the WebSocket itself other than the 14 byte buffer that's necessary for the header. Oh, so only when, the, when he's doing zero byte read then he hopes to eliminate the buffers, not when he's doing regular reads. Well, when he's doing regular reads, then he wants to you know, receive a sync. He passes in the buffer, like the user buffer, and he would then want it to write directly into that. Mm. Yeah, for some reason I can't find the API, so I have no idea. Because it's in a separate package. We added it in two places, didn't we, Stephen? We added it more on WebSocket, on more on WebSocket, WebSocket which is it's on both WebSocket, which is inbox, and WebSocket protocol, which is a 2.0 stand, and that's standard 2.0 right. only package. Basically, for ASP.NET only. Yes, but we, this this API is not ASP.NET only. It's going to have to go on both yep. places. It would be to change to both, though, it would be to changing both WebSocket create from stream and WebSocket protocol create from stream. Right. Yep. I still don't fully understand. So you could you you call create from stream once when you wrap the stream into a in a, in a web socket. Why would you want to specify the buffer sizes at the creation time if you want to control the buffer sizes for those special zero buffer reads? So today, the implementation basically maintains its own receive buffer 
that it allocates essentially once when the stream, you know, when you create the web socket, yeah. it has a receive buffer, it issues all receives into that buffer, and then reads out the relevant pieces into the user's buffer when they call receive async. Uh, for send async, we didn't want to make two networking or you know, two actual sends under the covers, one for the, the header and one for the body. So we have a send buffer that we take from, we rent from the array pool that we you know, put the header into, we copy the user's data into, and then we issue a single send for that whole buffer and return the array to the pool. So today, the WebSocket that gets created from this has a, a buffer that it allocates for the duration of the WebSocket for receives and a buffer that it rents per send from the pool. Um, he wants to get rid of all of those so that he can do uh, zero byte receives then know when there's data available, and then when he knows there's data available, have it read uh, uh, read the header into a small 14-byte buffer and then issue a separate read uh, into the user's buffer. And for sends, not use the array pool at all and do multiple network sends, or uh, multiple writes to the underlying stream, rather, uh, one for the header and one for the body. And the thinking is, if he gives it um, right now, the WebSocket is written with the idea that the underlying stream that's passed to it doesn't do any buffering. But if the underlying stream does do buffering, then we're essentially double, bu double buffering by having the WebSocket buffer itself. And so he wants to be able to say effectively, no, the underlying stream is doing all the buffering. It's cheap to do multiple writes or reads on the underlying stream because it's buffering for you. Ah, uh, I see. No, I, I guess. That sentence was the one that cleared up so, if we do this, I would suggest we add it as an overload at this point, not a replacement of the existing method. Why? It's less people have to react to it. Like they, they, if there's already people consuming this guy up above, uh, they don't have to change it. I know there are exactly two people using this API. Uh, client WebSocket, which is in the same code base, and uh, Signal R, uh, which David is doing this specifically because he's changing Signal R. Um, I, I'm not terribly concerned. I, I don't think we should ship APIs we don't expect to be used. All right, that's yeah. fair enough. Also, another thing is if somebody is using this API today, uh, it will just re uh, require recompilation, correct? It's not a, a source breaking change. It is a source breaking well, change. The signatures changed. You get rid of a byte array. And yeah, and, and, and the last two parameters changed to that, what they are there. They used to be memory of byte. If you were the, so, the previous signature has a buffer, an optional buffer is the last argument. If you were passing in a buffer, this would be a source breaking change. I see. So we take away ability to pass in your buffer, and you just pass in sizes, and then we borrow the buffers. That's yes. it. Okay. I originally suggested we had a buffer for for a few reasons. One, sort of the existing APIs around WebSockets do that, and two, I thought the ASP.NET folks would actually like it because they'd be passing in their but David saying they wouldn't use that. They'd much prefer this approach. Yeah. By the way, if, can you yeah, can you check your microphone because like we oftentimes hear you like you know from a far distance, almost can't hear you at all. We're experiencing a Doppler effect a little bit. Here. <laughs> <laughs> you go you go up and down volume wise quite a bit, almost like you're swinging your microphone I don't know as you're what talking. Talking about isn't that just the way? That <laughs> can you guys hear me better? Yes, that is way better. I put on a headset. The Doppler effect was probably me rocking back and forth in my chair. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Your chair must have an amazing range. Well, when you're when you're only a foot from your microphone, rocking back and forth at you know a foot doubles the distance. So, <laughs> but to be uh, nitpicky, Doppler effect is not volume going up and yeah. down. I I, I was. <laughs> Wait, no, you also said that right place to bring it up, yes. <laughs> Let's do some uh, <laughs> physics. It's funny how everyone understood physics what I was talking about. So the team that everybody is fine with the API is just that we just talked about whether we should emplace it or not. And it seems like emplacing is fine, right? And yeah, well, I think assets. we have to get shipper room approval for that, but at this point, we're, we're past lockdown. And it's going to yep. break ASP.NET. They're going to have to... As soon as we make this change, they're going to have to react to it. And our, our official builds going to be on the floor until they react. So if we added an overload, it w we wouldn't have these problems. We couldn't do it in two stage. Like you know, one day check it in the overload, 
and then you know wait for ASP.NET change and Just immediately password, remove that. But yeah. do a temporary you know yeah. transition. Uh, I would not like to ship API that we don't care about. Honestly, I mean, it's actually, stupid. So, so, well, we're not. We're past asking. Our we were in asking yeah. for preview two. Um, so, so, what's the process? Where, where do you send email? We, well, we have to. We have to send email, or David Fowler has to send email to Shiproom and ask them, like, you know, hey, I want to make this just uh, dot net core Shiproom. Okay. Dot net ship. Yeah. I don't know. You can. I'll tell him to work with me. So I mean, yeah, we can. We can. I was gonna also suggest that we could try doing the side by side for preview two, and then get rid of the. Second one, or get rid of the previous one for RC. Yeah. Removing APIs in RC, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't, so I don't care before, how things are. <laughs> we, um, sorry, before we like you know approve this, it'd also be good, or we can approve it, but it'd be good to really understand fully what the behavior is for when the receive buffer and send buffer sizes are null, uh, and when they're smaller than the implementation would want if it was buffering. I suppose you asked the question, but David hasn't responded yet, right? Well, I was just whoever follows up with David, if that's you, Carol, uh, it'd be great to just get that clarified. Yeah. Yep. And we should also be, make sure it's clear that this is going on both places, not just the one. Yes. It's going on uh, web socket and web socket protocol. Yeah. Let him do work with me. I want to loop in Murat as well. Be the silence button, not the pink button. <laughs> Wait, how they've got to run Red Root One now. <laughs> you make the silence button look that the pink button look exactly like the silence icon in the right. virus. So that was the last one we had in the two more months. On is that actually correct, or is there anything else that we need to do? Otherwise, I would just go with the ones that have arbitrary milestones attached. So only, only future, yeah. yeah. I don't want to go with the hardware ones because I think we should do a whole pass over that, and given that we cut it anyway from two one, I would not spend too much time on that, but maybe we should pick the other ones here that are like outside of the hopper bucket. Like this one, this one, this one, this one, what was the top one that we have? Concurrent, get semantics. Yes. I think this one we talked about and then that's it, but there is a little hot air Alright. And it's covered the span once for us because we we'll have <coughs> more knowledge about that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Alright. If Victor is on the phone, you should be able to talk to the. Yeah. Um. This is about introducing span overloads for a couple of APIs. Um, there was some internal discussion if we should also introduce memory 
um, of char APIs. So I talked with Ian about it, and he thinks there's some, if you scroll down, you can see that there's some memory overloads. Um, yeah, read-only memory, for example. Um, and Jan thinks that we could probably introduce new um, return types like a match value, a capture value, and a group value. Um, but I'm not sure if this is working because currently we have an inheritance between capture, group, and match. And therefore, um, I settled with the memory overloads. Sorry, you were talking about the match value and capture value being for this uh, uh, for the span-based overloads, and those would be ref struct types. That's what you were exploring. Um, I'm referring to to the overloads which currently take read-only memory of char, um, because Jan thinks that those APIs should uh, could benefit from accepting a span and right. returning a ref type. Value. Right. That's what I was asking. The, the options, it was either have a, a mem accept a memory and return the existing match or accept a span and return a ref struct match value. Right. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, but this is only one of the, uh, the, the one half of the APIs. The other half is simple, like, for example, try escape, try unescape, um, and replace and split those APIs currently accept span, and they should be easy to review. So how much do we benefit from those? Because, I mean, we basically have to plumb all of this stuff through the entire matcher to really take advantage of that. Yeah. Right? Doing um, the, the thing is, we are not interested in, in um, providing read, uh, span overloads for patterns, only for the input. That means that we only need to change the interpreter or the runner, but not the parser at all. So only the 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 upper the, the layer at, at at the top. My point is, we are not just converting the span back to a string and forwarded, right? Like we actually do yep. read the data from the span and then at that point, right? From the from yeah, and uh, if you if you scroll up, um, there's a link to to one of my PRs, um, and I already did the work for for all that stuff, and okay. yeah. Um, it's just changing the interpreter to to work with a span beneath. Yeah. How would this affect compiled references? Pardon? How, so we have a concept of compiled regexes, right? Does this affect that? Yeah. Um, the thing is, um, compiled reg regexes um, expose a lot of fields. So I had to split the interpreter from from the compiler because the compiler is exposed publicly, publicly, so I can't change it to accept the span. Um, so this only benefits currently the in interpreter, not the compiler. Does that mean that if you use the new span-based APIs with a compiled regex that you end up allocating a string for the span? Exactly, yeah. How deep do this go? How, uh, how much allocations do we eliminate? in the actual interpreter by going with these APIs? Um, it depends. For example, um, for example, regex.split um, ha had a lot of allocations before my changes, and now it's nearly zero. So it depends. Um, if you're just doing a match, it's not a lot less. But if you're doing things above the match, like you replace a split or whatever, it reduces a lot of allocation. You have some benchmarks of numbers that we see, like you know, okay, for this particular regex, this particular input, we reduced the allocations by I don't know 50 percent, or you know, we went from 80 yeah. megabytes to like 1,200 megabytes. I, or whatever. I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little concerned with the issue that uh, Levi brought up, though. The, um, I hadn't realized that for compiled regexes, this actually, these new APIs would actually be more expensive. And right. compiled regexes are what you use when you want to, when you're going to be invoking something so many times and you want to significantly reduce the cost. Right. Um, There's two notions, right? There is the, you know, when you when you construct a regex, you pass in the, you know, generate IL kind of thing. And then there is the other part of it, which is the pre-compiled regex to an assembly. Uh, which part I'm talking about the, f I'm talking about the former, the yeah. pass.compiled. So if we use IL, Victor, do we? Are you saying that even in the IL case, we are not be, like we basically have to convert the the span to a string, or is it just when you compile it to an assembly? No, it's for both. Um, 
th these changes all only benefit to the interpreter. I see. And uh, so the, the the limitation is a fundamental limitation, or it's just it's a lot of work to re to redo the. No, it's, it's it's yeah, it's it's a lot of work. But the the, the, the thing is, we are, we have exposed a lot of fields. If you, for example, look at APIs of .NET um, and search for compiled regex uh, runner or compiled yeah. regex factory, you see that we have exposed nearly everything of, of the internal internals. I imagine we could probably do it for the in-memory compilation ones, because that's complete in the same library. But when there's a separate library involved, the tools that are used to generate it all have to be changed, and those tools come from the data framework. Yeah, here you can see, for example, the run text is exposed, which is the string. So, but like this is, well, that we'll could see. be lazy, correct? No, no, it's a field. It's not a problem. Oh, okay. I see. So the problem is, I mean, like, there's two sides, right? I mean, I, if you have an existing compiler tool in the same the regex stored on disk, they will continue to use the regex runner class that exists in the framework, and those wouldn't benefit, right? Because it would be a breaking change for them. But I would, I would, I would guess if we construct a new regex in memory and just specify in the regex options compiled to IL, we don't have to go to the regex runner factory as it is today, right? We can we can do whatever we want to do there and like yep. have that yep. go through um, whatever mechanism we see fit. That's that's the the work I haven't done yet, but of course, um, it's, it's if we would if we if we would produce new IL or um, run new compiled regex system, we could re, uh, rewrite the current engine, yeah. Yeah, the, so the thing to me is, like, I agree with Stephen, like, there, there's a little bit of a pit of failure here that we, that we open up with that, right? Because on the one hand side, we're adding new APIs specifically aimed to make it more performant. But then when you square this with the existing API where you compile it to IL if you want to speed up, you basically now have two things that are designed to speed up that make it slower than what it, when it, than what it used to be, right? That seems like a bad, I guess, design point. Yeah. Um, with what I said, it would be like that. But if we would also change the regex compiler, then it would benefit from it. It's, it's just a lot of work rewriting the IL generation. No, I get that. I'm not saying like why well, you're not done yet. I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get <laughs> is that if we if we ship the new APIs, we probably should only do that once we have the compiler thing working with that as well. Otherwise, you're. Uh, I think that you know sometimes it. intermediate state where it's like you know it's not the. Uh, a lot of work and we're doing incremental change and longer term we will do you know the, the more work makes sense in this case it may not make sense because of this yeah. strange situation Victor is this concern with the compiled is this for all the APIs or just the span ones like your the memory APIs you added does this have the same does this suffer from the same issue yeah so yeah yeah so, Victor, I see regex runners public, but I don't see how anybody would ever get one. <laughs> yeah, this, this, these two types are only exposed to, to make um, pre-compiled regexes work working. Right, but all, so the, no all the real implementations of this class are internal sealed. Uh, so, who would ever read these protected fields? Like, if we wanted to change it and just not set them anymore, who would care? Doesn't the the, the pre-compiler, doesn't it spit out a type that derives from this and uses those? Right. And it would um, already have its fields? Pardon? I'm just wondering if we can make the base class support both the span or memory and the, the string, like if the pre-compiled external things are using one field ref and the new things are using another field ref, everything will just work. Yeah, so it's just about discussing if we should create a new type for it or just make the existing type um, better. Um, yeah, handle both cases. Yeah, I guess I mean, one, I mean like once we already buy into the fact that we change the code gen for whatever user code gets generated, the device on that, you could just have a different type. I mean, it doesn't have to be the same type, right? That can't be. You can either have yeah. you know new fields on the same type or new type. It doesn't matter. You have to change your code generator. It still doesn't yeah. change yeah. the fact that it's a, a lot of additional work. Yes. I can imagine. Yeah, I'm just saying we, we have the ability to yeah. fix it for both cases by just yeah. doubling the number of fields in this guy and making it 
Yeah, there's no fundamental thing that prevents it, right? It's just work essentially. All, all. I mean, yeah, the, the thing is, this is not this is not for two one. So this is for the next version of the right, code. Right. I mean, yeah, this is. I mean, we're just looking at APIs now for the future, right? I think to to me, like the question is more like, do you think that it would be worthwhile spending that money on it? Like, as in, like, um, do, do we see ourselves actually doing the work change in the the, the case for compiled regex? Because if the answer is no, then I think not adding the overloads to begin with is probably better than adding it like for only half the cases. I think um, because of our current state and with .NET that we are pretty slow in comparison with our, with our yeah, with for example Rust or whatever, um, we should spend some effort in those APIs. Right. I think there's this other larger work item that you have on your side, right, to like figure out what to do with the regex engine itself, right? There's this other I forgot the name for it, but this open source C based PCA. but yeah. And then the question what are we doing with that? Are we are we changing our implementation? Are we creating a new API surface? And I think that seems like the bigger bang for the buck, right? To figure that out first and then see how these span based overloads would fit into that. Maybe I make a suggestion. Let's assume we were just going to do the work to fix compiled and review the APIs in that context. Uh, maybe that'll give Victor a sense of whether this is a direction worth pursuing and yeah. um, whether it's you know worth then looking at the compiled. But we, you know, the APIs would only be added if and when the comp compiled was already there. Yeah. Let me just write this down first, and so we should. Like dry result or what? All right. So then let's go with the APIs and presume that we already have the best implementation everywhere. So what's the semantics now for capture? Like the idea is that if you constructed it from a span slash a memory and I access value, that will be bad because now we are allocating essentially, right? But if I access value span, then I get better results. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. The value is the capture um, of the input string here. So is it, what's it, what's it, back, what's it holding? A, a memory? No, it's yeah, um, spanned to the original string. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's Currently, it holds either a memory or a pin span, depending on the API you use. Well, it can't. It certainly can't hold a span because capture is a class. Yeah, um, and that's one of the things which I um, mentioned before that Jan thinks we could probably introduce new types like a capture value and a match value and all that stuff. If the class has to hold a memory, then shouldn't don't we say that we should return the memory so that you don't need to re-up convert it? Um, yeah, I had a memory before, but yeah, yeah. I wanted it to be a span. So, the, uh, okay, so if we have a memory field inside capture, memory has three fields inside. So it stores the original string and uh, two ints. I assume capture already stores the original string. Presumably, since it exposes value. 
Yes, so uh, it's kind of like it's a bit more expensive to store memory as a field than just two ints. So a solution that I've done in some code that I wrote is if I already have the, the reference type, the string, I would just store two additional ints and then on the fly produce either a memory or a span. But, but in their case, they don't have that, right? Because if you construct the whole regex from a memory of, sorry, with only memory of char, there is no string in the whole picture. Right? Correct, correct. If it's so not good. Mm -hmm. In this case, whatever underlying field they have for beta would be okay, null. Okay. And then yeah. Yeah. If, if, the, if the original thing is not a string, then yes. Because yeah, either value is the original total input. It's, it's not. I'm, yeah. I'm looking through the code right now. That's got to be a, a, a subset of the match. Yes. Uh, so the implementation would change to, if this it changed to a memory, I would I would do it as a memory and a, a string that yeah. is null. And the first time you call the string property, we lazy in it the string and then return it consistently. Yes. Uh, but the uh, yeah. so so even is, even if the input is memory memory not a string, then you need to if you store this substring this match as a memory, then you have two memory fields. They both store you know pointer to some string which again makes it a bit more cheaper to store memory and then two ints for the subset of memory. But like value and value span, right? Like refer logically to the same data, right? It's just that one of them happens to be the representation of a string and the other one is basically a sliced memory, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm not sure if I understand. So, so you construct a regex, right? Yeah. So you say match this regex against this text. This text may be a four kilobyte text blob, yeah. and it's in the shape of a read-only memory on char, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when the regex finds a match somewhere in that buffer, the capture represents that particular location, right? So the so the so the, so the value span we expose here is a subset of the original yeah. memory, mm -hmm. and then same goes for the value. So that so the value is just the substring for the for the for the, for the whole thing. So value and value span are logically the same part of the buffer. It's just that one of them is in the string representation, and the other one is in the span representation. And I think what Jeremy is saying is that if, if you, you know, we have, you have a read-only memory for the whole thing, so creating a slice read-only memory for the subpart is relatively cheap. But if we only give you a span and you wouldn't need a memory, well, then you have, again have to copy this thing into your own memory because you can't hold on to that, which is the problem we had in other places. Yeah, no, 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 I, I agree. I, what I, the only thing that I was saying is whether this type was, would store memory inside or it would store two ints. So currently, it stores the overall string and two ends, yeah. which sounds an awful lot like memory to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. so yeah. That's the reason why, why we introduced span of memory. Uh, well, memory that's, for them. that's easy. We just replace it to storing a memory. No, no, no. Yeah. But, that, but that assumes that we always have the string. And Imo was saying that we not always have the string, because sometimes you start this whole regex operation yeah. from not a string. It doesn't matter, it's exposed as chars anyway, which means you can always get a string back out of it. Yeah. So if we change, change mm -hmm. the input to allow passing in a read-only memory of, yeah. of char, then we would have the read-only memory of char would be yeah. what we held in the capture. The string property will continue allocating every call because that's what it does, uh, which is easy. We just do the memory dot to string. Yeah, okay. and Literally every call you actually it call, it call substr every single call. And then if, if the length is the original if the length is the original string it returns this, but I mean if our memory of T is backed by a string anyway, it returns this anyway. Yeah. So um, So I think Emo? this just is a memory and we it, just expose yeah. the memory. It can be optimized in many different ways. I mean yeah. you know, first time we do the conversion to string we could now store uh, uh, memory of char that yeah. points to the string that we just created now. Next time uh, you call to string, it doesn't actually allocate the string, it just gives you the string well, and don't, like... Don't we let you get the string back to my memory? Well, only if the memory, uh, the index is zero and the length is the length of the string. Yeah. It oh, would, um, uh, uh, well, we give you the string. Could you please open my PR, which I, which I linked index at the top? And length. So then you need to slice if this is not what you want to return. I'm just like, somebody could observe the effect of, oh, you called the, the trimming one, and now now I'm getting back a memory pointing at a different object. But Sir Victor, you were saying? Yeah, um, could you please open the linked PR at the top, um, Wichterhofer 1? Yeah, and left. Oh. And um, go to the changes, and then search for the capture class. 
this is your first pull request? This is awesome. To, to himself. <laughs> yeah, uh, to yourself. So go to the changes and search for the capture class. Because that will help a lot understanding what, what we're discussing right now. Now you, you can search by just typing T. Okay. Oh, no, um, search for the type capture. Sorry, what should I look for? This one, yeah, this one. Okay. Um, here you see that sometimes you accept a pin span and sometimes you accept a memory. It's not always a memory, it's sometimes a span because, for example, when we call replace or split, we don't need to allocate the memory, we can just use the span because we don't return the match. If we return the match, we need, to, we need to have a memory, but if we don't return the match, we can just operate on spans. What is memory or pin span? That's, that's a custom type. So, but what does it logically hold on to? Like a, a raw pointer? Yeah, you can search for it. Just search for memory or pin span. So. Is that in the PR? Yeah, it's a type. You lose a lot. But there you go. Oh yeah. I guess it does what the name suggests. <laughs> So there's a reason why we expose a value span and not a value memory, because sometimes we have a span and not a memory. But what, how does it work? Like you return a capture instance now that holds on to a pin span. No, no, no. We never, so we only use pin spans if we don't return an object to the caller. Oh, it's so just you internally pass it around between different things? Yeah, because regex replace and regex split uses also a match internally. Oh, yeah. I see. I... That seems like a for unsafe code, though. I think we really should get rid of this and just use memory. Because <laughs> it's going to be really easy to completely destroy ourselves with this if we leave it around. Well, use memory, but how... So if he just has a pointer to the string, what what does he do? He doesn't... He never... All, all the public API takes safe objects. Okay. So don't drop to a pointer. Okay. <laughs> That's the answer. So, okay, so you're not saying just use memory. You're basically saying don't use pointers to strings. Uh, yes. <laughs> Representing yeah, get rid of, of it. Get rid of this has nothing to do with the public exposed yeah. API. This I is only for internal work. No, I get that, but I mean, the, uh, I think to just echo his concern, right? The, the problem is, fuck, now I have to search for a capture again. <laughs> it just means that the, the, the match that was going to take a read only span of char needs to take a read only memory of char. Um, it takes a read-only memory of char. Okay, so as long as all the API takes memories <laughs> in and not spans, then we don't need to talk about char star in here ever. <laughs> yeah, but we have some APIs which take span and some APIs takes memory. Right, so so the ones that currently take span will take memory and then you get rid of char well, star. Well, <laughs> if you need to hold to the data, uh, you can imagine that there are some spans in the APIs that are like just temporary, like, you know, match yeah. against this thing. Maybe, but if the algorithm doesn't hold to the uh, to the value, then it doesn't need to be memory. And in fact, memory is less safe than span in this case. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to use memory if it's only short-lived. Yeah. I, the, I mean, the problem is, I mean, yes, I guess if the if, when the entirety of the public API is never going to give back any delayed access, then then that's one thing. But it, it's very very easy to get to lean into a pointer too early, and then now you're pointing at unmapped memory. I mean, using using span is just kind of viral, right? Because if you take span, then anything that you return has to be a ref struct if it's referring back to the original span, and so on. Yeah, that's why I, uh, what I'm saying is, like, if, if the argument that you take in, you store for later, yeah, it should probably be memory. But if it's short-lived, I would keep using span, because span is safer. Well, in, in this case, as you and I were discussing, like, lifetime management stuff, yeah. this would be a leaf API, correct? Like, this doesn't actually do any more work on the background thread once you call match, or once you call uh, is match. 
much, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, spam would be appropriate, assuming that you return the values correctly. I'm trying to figure out in which scenarios you're going to have user input in the spam instead of the memory. Yeah, there are some some cases, like for example, if you call escape or unescape. Escape or unescape what? Well, for example, if you use escape. like these APIs here, right? String. Uh, but why would yeah, escape right. need to return a capture? Like this here, right? So the idea being yeah. that you have a pattern in or you have a string that you may use inside to construct a pattern, so you want to escape everything that is magically a project. Yeah, but I, I don't see that needing to use the memory or pin yeah. span. This isn't returning anything, so this won't be fine. Yeah. Yeah, this is fine. Is match would be the weird one because yeah. it would. That's when it's presumably going to need to do a unified representation to walk through the rest of the engine. Actually, is match? I would expect to take a uh, read only span, not a read only. The reason being that it doesn't return anything aside yeah. from a boolean. I was just like, that's the reason that you would need a bifurcated implementation, or the oh, do a span. This is fast. Then the inside says stop. I need to go rent an array because yeah. I need to be safe from here By on. By the way, to me, it's not about uh, speed. Spans are safer than memory. I'm just. They I'm don't trying, have lifetime issues. I'm trying to so make this a, the the existing yeah. API makes sense with. Like yeah, I, I just commented on, like, because I don't want to get, like, uh, I, I don't think the right guidance is, if you don't need speed, take memory, because it's more flexible. Because memory is, yes, it's more flexible, but it's also more dangerous. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm so. trying to avoid the situation where we need to use pointers inside, if we yeah. think it's sensible to avoid it, uh, and to have an API that says span, so you think it's fast, and then the first thing it always does is go rent a, an array the size of the span to copy into it yeah. so it can use a memory yeah. for the unified no, implementation. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, except then it can't rent it because if it's giving you back the capture, then uh, it would have needed to have allocated it. So every call to the span one of is match would then need to make a string and then call the string one. So, oh, so then to summarize, like, is it is it basically when you call match, sorry, is match? you know that you're never ever going to return a capture, so it's completely fine to just pin the span and then have the rest of the engine basically allocate stuff from the heap that we know can never leak. But like, logically, once you return them, these objects are all now pointing to memory that they should never access anymore. Yeah, like Except you don't need to pin the span. Well, you kind of do, because you cannot really pass the span around in right. objects. So once right? you turn it into a pointer? Your internal structs will all have to be rough structs. Yeah. Used by the internal the implementation would have no, to no, be. No, yeah. Assuming that their implementation uses rough structs everywhere, I don't know if that's. Yeah. No, they use classes everywhere. So that, like, how would you put the span inside of fields of those guys? You, you can't. You have to put a point in there. Like, there's no other way to do it. What What are those classes used for? So, for so, so imagine this. So imagine, think of is match effectively as doing the same thing as match. So it gets back a match collection, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just checks for success true. Mm -hmm. But basically, you call an internal thing that constructs an object graph, and you just you never leak that object graph to the user. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. But that's so. If we were doing the implementation, redoing the implementation, I would like to avoid it. I mean, the idea behind spans is that uh, you know, like it makes the system safer. Yeah. Because now we don't have to use pointers. It's not the other way that suddenly now we have to have a bunch of pointers and hope that our code is. But <laughs> well, the problem that you have, though, is like I mean, like if you look at the allocation cost of the object graph, there's some size of objects that are being created, right? But the input buffer that you're may running the regex against might be ginormous, right? So let's say you have a, I don't know, a 10 megabyte text file, right? So if, you know. In order for us to avoid copies from the capture stuff back to the original thing by allocating strings, we kind of need a way to do that. So we can either say, screw, we always use memory of T, or memory of, of, uh, of, of char, and never use span, or you have to store a pointer, but it's one or the other. Like, you cannot make... No, um, I, think, I think what Christoph is saying makes sense, because um, I was playing with the idea that um, to change internal, internally the structure to to be a ref struct for, for these cases where I don't return a match. Where I just introduce a new type and use that one. Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean if you can replumb your implementation to basically never hold on to a, 
a span inside of a class, then I guess that is definitely beneficial. All I'm saying is that assuming we can't do that without massive cost, then I don't see an alternative to what we currently yeah, do, yeah. which is... I, I think, Sorry, I mean, the way, that you, the way that you would do it to make the span work and everything be sane is the in, once you get inside the thing, is match, calls match with, and don't allocate the return graph. And so it gets to go through all the same common code, sure. it just doesn't return any of the objects. So then it yeah. can be playing with the, like, you give it a span and a memory, and, like, the memory's allowed right. to be and but, but your proposal is like similar to the other one, which is basically assuming you can change implementation to do exactly that, like in a same way. Yeah, so so I, I guess it is it is possible to avoid the pointer and to have is match and match share a code base. Uh, it just requires extra plumbing, and if we're willing to do that cost, then, then span is the right type for the shape. It's right. just we need to make that sure that we don't that have the right API and then the wrong implementation. Right. That, that, uh, presumably that cost also comes with additional uh, perf benefits for the ismatch. Yeah, I'm sure that would help other yeah. places too. Yeah. yeah. And there, there, you know, the I just want to make sure that I call out the, the specific scenario that's interesting for the uh, file matching because like we're doing very small strings, so ismatch is super useful to be super performant. So the one thing as far as allocations. on our guidelines, so let's say we can't change the implementation to make it ref structs or do what you suggest. Let's say we can't do that for whatever reason. Would we then either say we never take a span ever and we only take memories in the public API to avoid having storing a pointer, or are we doing what uh, Victor is currently doing, which is we store basically pointers? <coughs> or would we prefer in that case? Why would we not be able to redo the implementation? Let's just say cost. We're not willing to, to do that. How, how large are the strings that you expect to be input to this? The, the read-only span of char, like what length do you expect to be passed in? For my scenario, it's 2, 6, 255 characters. So, stupid idea, but this would work. Uh, you have a thread local storage string. And that's your buffer that you just keep writing into every single time you call match. Over no, but I mean, like, while that's what Jeremy K needs for you know file system, like the average caller of this, uh, think exactly the anti-pattern of dictionary contains key followed by dictionary get value. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone's going to open a 187 megabyte text file. They're going to call is match. And then they're going to call match. So yeah, I, I actually had I, I toyed with that co idea actually of like <laughs> being evil with strings, and you know while while the 255 character thing is the normal one, I also like with glob star stuff you actually have to look at the full path stuff, and you know I, mean, I, 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 I thought about like cache I thought about well maybe I could cache the string and then pin that thing and fill data into it and <laughs> like yeah, well no. There's just too many too many com combinations to throw in. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, to answer your question, before we know that we cannot do it the right way, I would not explore how we do it the wrong way. It's not about the wrong way. It's more about, I guess, what our guidance is for those cases. Like, is it basically, like, don't do it ever. So rather not having any span and read only like memory overloads. Or would we then say in that case just accept memory to avoid the pointers? Like it's like I'm just saying. our current guidance is um, if it's an async operation you take memory if it's otherwise you span and maybe we have if you need to store it for later then it's memory otherwise it's span. Here, here's a question: Can we uh, like add the span one later as an overload? Like next to memory, basically. Well, yeah, so well, yeah, exactly. You know, is match starts with memory because we don't have the implementation, and then we add a span one. But so once we here's again my my it's problem ugly, but is I APIs that take memory are less safe. I don't. I agree. Them. If we can avoid them, we should avoid them. So I'm not in favor of let's add memory because it's easier and then add span. No, I think, I think like, that's maybe we extrapolate from what you said. It's not about async versus non-async. It's more about if the thing is stored for later access, right? Which sure. is basically yeah. a property of async. Yeah. Which in this case it doesn't if you look at this match. So it's, it doesn't do it for is match, but it would yeah. surely do it for match, right? Because yeah, you, yeah. you basically give yeah. back a match, uh, a, a match collection. So the other only alternative that we have is 
by hooking the API server similar to what Jan suggests, so we add capture value and match well, values. I also don't uh, why match needs to store it. The the, the value that you ma it ju just needs to. Uh, uh, match will give you back the entire substring that matched the regular expression and captures each of the like parentheses groups inside. Right. So match tells you this is the substring that matched this pattern. So it it is it is complicated slice. <coughs> mm -hmm. So it, it needs to give back a it needs to give back a span, but since it already returns a class, it needs to give back a span. And our problem is we have existing API servers that happens to be classes, right? So like we either have an option to say they all talk in terms of memory because it's the only thing you can store in a class. Or we say, no, screw it, we add new types, capture value, match value, whatever, that are wrapped structs. Well, how and do you then they can do that. struct match collection? Well, that we would have to probably change the API shape in something sensible that we flatten it or something. No, like you have a wrap structure. But that's that's where you do the innumerable pattern, right? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. you, you would basically have to say you get back a uh, basically a span of, of you get back a where's the backing memory for that span? Well, it would be you you pass in the span that we write into, right? But yeah, it gets complicated. As I'm saying, but I mean, like ignoring that for a second, that would be the only way we can use spans everywhere in that case. So yeah, and that's also what Jan was proposing. That's such a mess. I, I I agree with you that I think once you once you try to replicate what current match and capture give you. And do it as rest tracks, it will not be like ignoring the fact that we not duplicate the API service for the results, it also is messy in terms of you know what the API shape is. Especially because when you think of the typical interaction point of spans where you give it a span that you write into and it's not large enough, like no the, I, I don't know how we would store this on the other end and replicate it without rematching the whole thing every single time. You really want to be a, a win thirty two enumerate API of every of you call it and it always writes one more into the next thing that you're doing, and right. then you call it again, and you. Uh, yeah, in that case, you really want a persistent regex engine that and you know can, work. can actually use it. Now we need a delegate type. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much of this will be viable without basically writing a new regex API. Like yeah. I think that that becomes so viable at that point that it's like, okay, there's a new namespace with a new API shared because that's kind of what it has to be at that point. So uh, the now you regex. Regex. Yeah, so so. So, Christoph, the, 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 the question, I mean, we've talked about how is match could be done to be a span right now, but yeah. we're going to have the, the point coming forward of as we start evolving things, when we have existing patterns that we need to go into, even if the right shape of the API is span, if we have a heap limitation, do we take the memory and, sure. and indicate it? I mean, if we, if we basically run into a case, like, it's not just, you know, cost. Um, sure. You're yeah. saying like, well, the you know the shape of the API that we want, let's say, and we want to have consistency with existing APIs that are classes and store things and whatnot. Sure. Then we, uh, then I'm fine with memory. It's more tricky to use those APIs, but it's fine. What I don't want to do is, well, unless the cost is like enormous in months, but I would not want to say, geez, you know, this is this is going to be a week mo uh, more work. Let's uh, have a sub optimal API. Yeah. All right. So, you know, from the pre-code review, uh, I, I think both Levi and I will get very snarky if uh, the final code contains char star in it. Uh, so <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll need to make sure that the implementation correctly supports span and, and memory, but otherwise. So is it, is it fair to say that, like you said, memory is less safe than span, but I think we agree that it's a little safer than pointers internally, right? So like yes, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, like, yes, I haven't fine. finished my decision on that. <laughs> fine, it's safer. Me memory is fine. Owned memory is the dangerous one. Well, except if you have memory, you don't know whether there's an I mean, no on memory. It's an abstraction that you don't know if it's backed by something that you need to treat specially, which yeah. means it's a bad abstraction. Right. It's a gun. It may or may not be loaded, and it may or may not be pointed at your foot. Yeah. But it's better than a pointer. But because it is loaded and well, pointed, but because you it's an abstraction, it's you don't know where it's pointed. Well, no, no, but, but uh, I wouldn't call it bad abstraction. Just don't point the gun and don't pull the trigger. Maybe there's no bullet, but you know it's not worth trying. But if it's an abstraction, you don't know where the gun's pointed. You just have a trigger. No, you also have retain and release. 
You also have a trigger lock. <laughs> yes, retain is the same thing. <laughs> Okay. So what was your so, so that I think got us to uh, uh, oh so but now we still need to decide should capture return the span or the memory I think since it has the memory it should return it following our best type available yeah, it, it sounds like for guidance we should be saying if you have an API that needs to return like a, a substring of its input always take memory instead of span with the exception of being things like span slice if you need to write out uh, output somewhere, take your destination buffer as a span as well. Where that buffer could represent a collection of what that would be. That way the caller is always in control of all that memory, Which is what span is for. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> There's a trade-off here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a usability trade-off, certainly. Well, it's it's usability, it's deep safety, and performance. If it's a function, then span to span. Like span slicing is fine. Yeah, yeah. The problem is this isn't a function. There's an intermediate state object that gets passed back, which is on the heap. So that moves it to memory to memory due to the existing implementation. Well, we already said that if you are if you're returning a match collection, like you can't do that with rough trucks. You have to take yeah. a span of match as well as your destination parameters. At that point, like, what are you returning aside from true or false? Yeah. And the other thing is now you have potentially an issue where somebody's calling match. Like regex does a lot of work to process the data, and then after doing a lot of work says, by the way, your destination is too small, sir. I had a trillion matches. Yeah. You should double and try again. Okay, let me do more work. Oh, you should double and try again. Like, you know. Yeah, turn like an O of N squared into an O of N sad. <laughs> still, uh, still call it open, so you're fine. Well, when we, can create, we can create we can create a collection of spans of char, <laughs> right? A span of span of char, you can't do that. You can create a span of create something that contains span of char. I am not. I'm not. Uh, yeah, you, we cannot. Okay, yeah. Uh, wait, can you, can span can't truck, be used as uh, generic. Can you use a rough truck at all as a T? No. No. Then you can't have a span. Well, I was say I was uh, not saying that we it would be a generic one. Yeah. But even non-generic one, we cannot because array is keepable. Yeah. We cannot store spans. Yeah, you need to make it as a. It would need to be a an enumerator API. You couldn't do it as a collection. It could be a very large struct that contains. Uh, <laughs> I am capable of pulling up to one thousand. <laughs> 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 you got to overload when you need two thousand. That's a new type. Yeah. <laughs> we just tell you. Right. Why to pull it? Okay, so capture should return a memory and then presumably devalue memory. Yeah. So I was looking at the name of this. Property. It would be nice if we had a generic name convention for things like this. A value slice? Yeah, I was thinking about value slice. Yeah. Consider that you're not, but it may not be a slice. But it might be. And if it's the, if it's the entire string, that is still a valid slice. Well, isn't, but in this particular case, won't value be null? Like, it's a little strange to say that you're taking a slice of something that's not yeah, there at all. The value property currently always calls substring. So uh -oh. value property would just call value slice dot two string. Yeah. Well, then it's not a slice. It's always the full thing. No, no, no. The, 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 the new property would potentially be a slice of the original input memory. What is, what is, the, what is the value property going to return? The same thing it always would have. It's the value property and the value spam property, or whatever we call it, return the same data. Exactly. So how is it a slice? So value slice is a slice off of the original input string. Value is a copy of that data. It's it's like this engineer that went to buy bread and milk. <laughs> you know this joke. 
English. I don't, nor do I understand what we're talking about. <laughs> so, 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 Steve, the implementation of value right now is essentially capture is capture is memory. It holds the original string and a and an offset and a length. Uh, so, the implementation of value is <coughs> save value dot substring offset and length. So that will return will will change capture to hold a memory. It will return that memory dot go allocate a string and stuff. Uh, the value spans, value slice, whatever we want to call it, would just return that memory. No, I, I get that, but value dot length will always equal value span dot length, correct? But yeah. value already has an existing. Somebody could be annoyingly, depending on the fact that it doesn't return the same reference on multiple calls. I, I don't. I think. Uh, I think Stephen Shosain slice is a terrible name for the property. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, Jamie is saying. Is subset a set is its own subset? Yeah, but that is suggests that it will. I mean, calling something a slice suggests that it could at some point be smaller, and this will never be. Right. All right. I was just trying to come up with a property name of when we need to add a span or memory next to an existing string or array that maybe slice is the right suffix on it. Value two. I, I think it's. Well, I would go with it span is. or memory. <laughs> like, let's just call it what the type is yeah. and. Uh, unless it's unless it's actually potentially going to be a subset, that's you know a, a strict so subset. Value memory, is that the idea? Yeah, I mean we could we could take that argument too and say well then clearly it needs to be a memory representing the same referenciness of value, but we're not like we're intentionally not doing that because we don't want to copy. Uh, value has existing semantics, but if we only look at the semantic value that is returned, then introduce a derived class and use member hiding. <laughs> Reuse a name value. Then you need to cast. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm fine with value memory or value slice or. Can you guys read that? Like this is basically what I just wrote down as the summary of that. Make sure uh, the last that. point is the last point is wrong because this match already accepts the span. No, I, that's what I'm saying earlier is that we shouldn't based on the current state of the world. So it's. It, is match shouldn't take a span if we can't sensibly operate on spans. About hex. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we can sensibly operate on spans, then it should take a span. Yeah. Uh, and I would say it can. Okay. So I think oh, but the thing is, it doesn't today, right? That's what we said. Yeah, it does. Right now. It just pins. It just pins the span and works with the pointer. Exactly. That's what we said. We don't want the implementation to do that. Right, so that, that will be the Jeremy's argument of like this is not a sensible way to operate on spans. I, I would just hate to change to force a particular public API service just due to an implementation of the That's fair, but I don't think you get to separate them. Like if you care about security, like I think the question is like it's a function of like how how fragile is our implementation and like how how if, right? if if it didn't have modes where it both returned persisted reference against the memory you gave it and just a bool like if it was always the span based thing that's fine and if it was always the heat based thing that's fine the problem is this one bridges the gap and I just want to make sure we don't end up with an implementation state where we start leaking pointers to deallocate oh, memory. Yeah, yeah. I mean if, if we have to make the trade off we have to it's just I, I would prefer not to. I agree. I think Victor this is the other thing that I, that I talked with Dan about like I, I really think we need to take a deeper look at regex and you know, especially the engine discussion to see whether, you know, is it even worth trying to like massively fix regex or are we not ending up in a world where we basically create an entirely new API surface anyway? In which point it might be cleaner to just leave regex as it is and just have a, a new API on the side and design that API with the constraints in mind so we don't end up having to do these crazy hacks. Because I think it might be worse. I mean, even with Jan's suggestion, like even if we could pull it off, I think we make regex substantially worse if we now have two different return types, two different modes, but they're all in the same type, and now it's really hard to reason about what the heck is going on. It seems to be potentially a worse trade-off. On the other hand, yeah, I think we, I think we need a separate meeting for that. Yeah, exactly. So, but I think that that you know. Well, but it would be useful if. Uh, like forget about implementation. It would be useful to s if if somebody sketch, like what would the API look like? Because if it's very similar, 
maybe it's okay to just you know bolt it on top of this. Right. If it's very s uh, different, then I I kind of agree with yeah. you. It would look like a Franken design of two different APIs put together. And that's the one I don't have a good handle on. But like talking to Dan, there were a few things where, you know, we have this concept of I forgot what it is. I think it's was it captures. Like there's this one thing that the regex engine has in the .NET world that nobody else has, which makes it really hard to replicate it over the other engine. So there's certain things we can't do. Was it named captures? I forgot, but there was one thing where we yeah we can't do that if you if you rely on that. We also have many features that make the regex. A uh, hundred times slower for the common scenarios, so we can support some corner case scenarios. I know at some point somebody did an analysis. I don't know. I don't remember now the details, but there are some features that are just crazy expensive. But presumably, if when we're looking at the regular expression string, not the string to be matched, but the actual pattern string, yes. presumably we could just say, oh, we're not using any of that. Go down and optimize for that. Maybe. Maybe. Hey, let me just add the one. I don't know what's going on here with my. Does that make sense, Victor? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, could we also briefly discuss the other points which I pointed out in the sure. initial post? There's no briefly here in this group, but yeah, we can totally <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> okay, so scroll down because I, I yeah, here. Yeah. So we already discussed the first one, but the start at overload, for example, is interesting to me. Sure. What, what does start at do? Like, what does it mean? Um, it means that you, that you, yeah. It means that you only start at searching at a specific location. So, um, how to explain? <laughs> so basically, you're, you're saying like the like the regex pattern will only start matching. Add start add not anything before it, right? Yeah. Because you cannot slice strings cheaply. It's probably basically you pass an int and say, you know, search this string from this location. For span, it doesn't make sense because you can just slice the span. Can oh. it backtrack from that starting point? Let's see. Yeah, uh -huh. I agree. We we kind of you know many APIs in the framework that take today array or array and and ints. We now just have you know, same method that takes a span. We don't add span that takes that takes an int. I mean span and an int. Yeah. Makes sense. Does it help you, Victor? Yeah, let me check briefly what I discussed with Jan. What was the exact issue here? Bunch of English words thrown together, they don't know what they mean. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, right to left. That makes sense. I was thinking one time layout or something. Yeah, the thing is, um, start at marks the um, start of the location where to start searching. Um, um, yeah, um, it, had, it has different semantics because you start searching, for example, at position six, but the original input string will still be the full string. Um, for cases like where it's split and where it's replaced, that makes sense because it returns the it always returns the full input string. So, for example, um, you call regex replace with start at six. You will still get the um, the zero to five slice um, at as the first as the first um, capture. Oh, you're saying it just doesn't replace in the in the slice, but it operates on the whole slice. Yeah. On the original. On the original, yeah. Oh, I see. That's what we also do for backtracking, right? Like we match the thing of the text before as part of the backtracking, right? Or not backtracking, but like the look back essentially. Yeah, that could also be relevant here. Yeah, that. So that means we can't do this with slicing because you need to basically be able to see past the starting point. Like, like this. Yeah. 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 Sure. That. So that's a. Diff that's basically not this. Operating on slice is just saying, operate on the whole thing. Just do something special uh, from this location. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that seems uh, reasonable. So what does right of left do in regex? We literally like read the input from from the end to the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. It starts searching from from the end. So at the end. How does this work with like UTF-16? That's another interesting question of like, you know, let's say we want to support UTF-8 regex matching, right? Today we'll be screwed with our current regex engine. <laughs> Which is another reason why maybe you want to look at a new API that doesn't do that. Yeah, I think in this case we would not support right to the left, probably, for UTF-8. It would just say, you know, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, so what's your question in that context? You want to know whether... Yeah, um, if, you, if you call regex split, um, and which returns an enumerator, the, the thing is, if you pass right to left as an option in, you can only get the, the return, the returned enum uh, enumerable objects from right to left, not from left to right, because you start uh, matching from right to left. So. In the current implementation, we store all the return values in a list and then call reverse on the list, and then return the return objects from left to right. But as we introduce an enumerator here, we can't do that. Right. Well, if we can't do it, then I guess you either throw... Presumably with our cost, right? You can still do it. It's just going to... You'd have to copy it off. Yeah, but the idea here is with the numerator that you only do the cost which you need in the in a sense of a loop, for example. Sure, but like having a specific caveat for right to left, just because of the way right to left is, is like that ends up being a documentation problem. 
Yeah. I mean, in, th in those cases, I'm also okay with throwing because you can just say, you know, you, you specified regex options that even the data that you pass in doesn't blend very well. So you just say, yeah, if you really want to do that, that's fine, but then call the other way overload. Yeah, one way or another. Like, it seems pretty bad to just magically deteriorate performance if you've passed in the wrong arguments. Especially because you're using APIs that are geared for not doing that. Yeah, and, and the last point is from Stephen. Um, the thing that I exposed it. Um, yeah, maybe Stephen can explain better. Uh, I'm trying to page this back in. Uh, oh, <laughs> right. Um, so the split method that Victor's defined uh, is returning an enumerator. Um, but in order to be able to for each it, since for each doesn't work with enumerator, only enumerables, he's exposed to get enumerator method off of the enumerator that returns itself. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite clever, actually. Yeah. It does seem a little bit like a hack, but sometimes I pull it both interfaces before the numerator and the normal. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. Like, I mean, that's. I think though they always try to be resilient too when you call it twice. So, and this one will presumably not work when you when the second guy asks when you get the numerator because you just return the same instance and then bad things are happening. In, in the places where we're already using this, in some places in the file system, we just create a copy from the second call. Yeah, it, it creates a copy, what I understood. This is not completely new. Quite frankly, that sounds like a language feature. Like, why would the neural allow that? Well, for, uh, enumerator and enumerable? And yeah. Same time? Be able to, like, I mean, enumerator, like, Positive for each. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward pattern. Like, why do you uh, want to think about the code? Well, I'm not sure what you're saying because you can do it. No, you can't. For each doesn't work with enumerators, only enumerables. Yeah, but you can have a method get enumerator and then return yourself. Well, that's what he's doing, but the problem is now you are kind of. Yeah, the, the point is that's working or it's working around the lack of a language feature. I think that's what he was saying. Yeah. Probably because the state gets really weird when you try enumerating over, when you call for each over an I enumerator, because I enumerator already has state, it has position. Presumably, whoever got it already has it inside of a using statement. Now you're going to for each again. So now you have, like, now you're intentionally doing things like double dispose, double enumeration. And I imagine the state just gets kind of wonky about that. Yeah, so this is the negative of, uh, you know, a single value having being both. Well, so the next solution is you need to have two different values. You have the collection and the enumerator. Maybe. I'm not sure how it's a language limitation. It's just physics limitation. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly an argument. I mean, like, like there was, you know, there was the, the motivation to add the enumerator method because you... You wanted to write for each loops over that, or? Um, yeah. <laughs> right. I wanted it to be as close as span itself, which also has a good enumerator, but works kind of different. Yeah. So regex for enumerator is a new type then, right? Like that doesn't exist today. Yeah. Is it public or is it internal? It's public, right? In the design, which one? The yeah, it has to, it has to be public because uh, it's a ref struct. Who would return that from where? So the split call, the regex split call, which has uh, oh, regex dot split enumerator. Have we never returned in 
something that's logically innumerable that yields some spans and it's a graph track? I don't think we did, right? The only place we have is spans get enumerator. And what does that do? Uh, well, you're, you're, if you're for eaching it, you're for eaching over the span, so it doesn't have the same issue. It, for each is going to end up calling get enumerator on the span, which returns the span enumerator, or span dot enumerator, oh, which see. is a ref struct. I see. I see. And making it a split enumerable and like handling get enumerator meaningfully is not possible. Yeah, it is possible, but what's what's the reason for that? Consistency and like stuff just works. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, it will be my <laughs> fast response to that. Because uh, I mean, like Christoph is kind of right. It is a bit weird to for each over an enumerator in general because it does beg the question of like, what do you want the semantics to be, right? Like, I think. In your particular case, it was literally like for each, you know, var item in split, it looks reasonable, right? But like, well, in the other cases that we have this where they're joined, we call it, we call it an enumerable. Yeah. That they're so it would be split enumerable, not split enumerator. The other option here is you say you don't use for each, you get the enumerator back, and you just call move next current on it. Yeah. True, but I mean, like, that, that is, like, it's unfortunate now when you go from string to read-only span, like, your code pattern completely changes. Right. Then the next option is we, I mean, that the issue of whether for each supports enumerator comes up, like, every version of C-sharp. Uh, we could revisit that as well that's with the language team. I think that's probably a better discussion to have than to hack it around, I guess. Well, can't we change this into s split enumerable? Yeah, it's, it's just a name, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah the question perfect. becomes, is it, do, um, this is a case where we're artificially injecting in a way to, uh, an enumerable in order to make this thing for eachable. Right. And if we believe that's going to be more common now, maybe we should revisit it in the language. If it really is going to be one-off things like this, then we can you know, introduce the extra layer of the enumerable. We've combined them in other places, though, from a performance standpoint. To this, these, that's a class. This is a struct. All right. Good point. Sorry. I mean, I would say that, I mean, one, one thing that is reasonable, like, that avoids most of the problems that Levi was mentioning, is that to say, you know, for each works with a method call if the method returns an enumerator, but you cannot actually for each an instance, right? That you don't have the double dispose issue because you clearly acquired the thing. It's, it's clear who has ownership. Yeah, I mean... Like, like the double dispose isn't really an issue per se because like every enumerator should handle it just fine. I think it was just weird, so they didn't do it as a language feature because you have these weird edge cases. That's all. You have to know that you cannot enumerate it twice. twice unless it's like you finish the first one and then probably you can enumerate it again. Because then you know reset. You just implement reset, and you can do it. Again. You just you have to be careful. It's, it's suddenly it's a special type, which is why I think that like, combining it with method call might be reasonable because then you can just say, well, you, you're the first, right, and you can only for each it if you, you never observe the variable, right, and then it's clear that you have to ownership. Yeah, it just introduces new kinds of types in the language. There's a new type that you cannot just store in a variable. Well, that's a new type from a type system perspective. No, you can. You can just certain things don't compose, but that's reasonable today as well. That is a definition of new type. No, it's not kind a of type. It's not a type. Things don't compose. No, no, you, it is. It is literally like the same as today. Like if you, you can totally. So let's say you say for each bar x in split, right? I can totally take the split thing and assign it to a variable, and uh, it just means that you now have this thing that oh, you, you you can't actually do this over the instance because I'm not. I'm not, I'm not owning that thing. Oh, now you cannot for each over the instance? Yeah. You can only for each in the context when you acquire it at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I don't know. That's a weird type. So you, you're putting new restrictions on that are not visible in the metadata of this type. It has a method get enumerator and you cannot for each it. Mm, that's strange. Well, 
n no, it's like similar to all the syntaxes don't work the, the same way. It's more like a syntax restriction more than anything. Right? Like if you think of like if you say new foo, I can add braces and initialize properties. Right? I can't do this on instances. I can only do it when I combine it with a constructor call. Like it, like it, it's kind of like you know just basically forcing a certain ownership model. That's all it does. But anyway, I think it's something we should be looking into. All right, then I think we are done with this one. And we have half an hour left. That's a good exercise. That was a good exercise, yeah. All right, talking about spans and paths. So the first ones are the ones we added where we're actually writing into spans. Um, Which one? I didn't oh, yeah. cross the bridge with uh, full path and the others down below because it was just more work than I was able to bite off. What did we land with join? Did we say we go with join? Is that what we said? Yeah, we went with join. So those are the approved ones up there. Yeah. So the second the second block is the ones that I want to add. There's one other weird piece to this, and I guess it's also true for join, although you can kind of calculate it yourself, is that uh, I, I wasn't sure if we already had a pattern where we could pass out like cars needed, because we know what the likely count is going to be, and I call it out in the notes. So if you try to get full path, you know, we'll get some sort of feedback as to like, either from the OS or when we know in our own calculations what it's intended to be. I see, like a, w kind of a hint of what your destination size should be? Yeah, it's it's a very accurate hint, but it's not 100% accurate because it's based off of the current yeah. working directory. So we have, we have APIs like this in some of our transformation APIs. But we said it's an upper bound, right? It can't be just... Yeah, the same here. It would be... Well, it would be... Says him, like, can the number be larger or smaller? Because we said it needs to be an upper bound, right? It's, there is no upper bound with this one. It can change because of the current working directory uh, being process-wide. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it's just... It's a subtlety that's there in, in a number of APIs on the, on the native side, and they don't do anything to call out the fact that like you shouldn't like depend on the because it means people do this sort of pattern right where they call it with a zero length to get what the buffer size should be and then assume that it's going to fit which happens correctly 99.9% .9 of the time uh, so yeah so this is a bit dangerous because if it's max it will never fail if you don't have it the color of this API is like geez I guess you know I'm gonna try this destination and if it doesn't work I'm gonna try something else if we have a method that is not the upper bound, somebody writes code, it always works, they never add a fallback, and then it stops working. You mean the thing that max path was originally intended for? Well, I mean, we do have a max bound, but it's like, what is it, there, EK or something? Yeah. So, so the, the, max, the, max bound, the max path now is Unicode string. No, but you, you know why max path is never, like, is fixed to 259 for all time, though. Is because people allocate max path, but and as soon as you bump that above two, no, I see, yeah. like you start getting sure. But like, yeah. it's it's actually it's more complicated than that, and it is changing now because the the bump the, the APIs. It's very hard to get into a situation where you where you mess up. Yeah. But so because you have to pass in the size of the output buffer for everything. So regarding looking at some of these APIs, like. Try get temp path for instance. Isn't that static while the app is running? The temp path. Yes. So one of the things I was considering. Well, it's effectively static. So you can change the environment variable. Yeah. And blow everything to hell. But like, if you do it, I mean system wide. But if you do it in the process, and it's not unheard of that people do this sort of thing. It's like, oh well, I want my I want my XE to have a different temp path, right, that I'm going to control and set the environment variable, and they do it sometime after setup, startup, and blah, blah, blah. Is, is it's kind of, it's playing with fire, but, I mean, I I, I was considering changing the, uh, the uh, get temp path to actually cache the value. Yeah. I didn't do, I didn't do it because we're so late. It's something I would do in the early part of the 
of a. Uh, well, if you if you have get ten path cash the value, then what's the purpose of trying get ten path that writes to a spam? Uh, well, no, that's there is no real point outside of like that. If we find in the case in that particular case, you know, it'd be something. Well, yeah, yeah, I'd like to try that because it seems like a rational thing to do. And then we find out, oh, good lord, it like falls over in all these cases where people are doing these these sort of semi-normal things. And, uh, you know, it becomes, an, it, we can abstract that behind the implementation detail, right? Yeah. I think it would win this feature. It's horrible. Yeah. I yeah, 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 yeah. iOS and it breaks everything. Especially when you coordinate between processes and then they realize they were snapshotted by the time the process was launched. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, you know, there are there be dragons, but it seems reasonable at first glance, but not something I wouldn't want to have like bait for a long time before we ship it. So I would say like if you can give people a max API, and I think it's using to say the inter API interaction is you write the loop, right, and then it might take you three iterations until you get it. Yeah, well, the only tr the only tricky part is it's like. You know, at least on Unix, it's typically a thousand characters, and Mac, it's four thousand. But like on Windows, it can be thirty-two thousand characters long. Yeah, it, 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 it seems it seems abusive to me to to like know, for example, right off the bat that it's probably going to be a thousand characters, and make the users jump through that hoop. I just started with 256. It seems like a good number. Well, how do we expect uh, users to expand their buffers? Or, like, are we talking about a rate pool here or something else? I mean, I mean yeah, yeah, typically. Well, I would we say... Won't, we won't stack out here. Like, we we would... We're planning on making code analyzers, and if you stack out, like, in a normal pattern while calling these guys, those analyzers would fire. Why? Because they don't do that. So don't stack out in a loop, certainly. And don't do it based on variable length of code. Oh, well, so I think the common pattern is you stack alloc, try, yeah. Uh, yeah. if it fails, then you yeah. rent. That, that would work okay. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what we'll be doing internally. Can you yes. say that about it? I don't think you can. Yeah. absolutely can. And it's it will process very easily. Yeah. It actually bumps as you execute code. I thought that they compute the, the stack size statically for the frame. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't yeah. know that. <laughs> Security at all. God, who does that? Um, yeah, we should like. I'm just the question how do you grow the buffer, right? Sensibly, right? Yeah. Like, if, if we don't give people an easy way to build the buffer sensibly, they're going to fall back to dangerous conventions, which we don't want to encourage. I think it, it is, actually, I was not completely joking. I think it's reasonable to start with 255 on Windows and see where you, because I mean most paths probably will be less than 255 given yeah. that it was. Yeah, yeah. So I mean that's that's the typical scenario. Well, it's 260, but like. Or right, 260, whatever it is, yeah. But, you know, the uh, one of the things that would be potentially useful going forward is if we actually like develops like the value string builder or something that allows people to do the patterns uh, around uh, Building off the stack, and then I mean we're using it internally, but if we had something public like that and took that as a riff, in API you can use it basically codifies those, so you just basically call methods on them rather than having to like know the actual sizes and core mechanics. Yeah, yeah. So we we have the the value string builder does that. I mean that's what we're doing internally, right? So yeah. to be able to have something like that public would solve a lot of this. then it's not your problem to figure out anymore. It's all internal. Can't hear you anymore. Well, we're not saying anything. We're thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes we do that, too. Um, I would you don't know this email, but with the new version of Skype, we can actually hear your thoughts. <laughs> 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 Shit. <laughs> so I would... Uh, I wonder whether... We shouldn't start with just this API without the hint. Think about the value builder solution or some other solution. 
if we get feedback that you know we cannot do the other solution and we get feedback that people still need this property we can add it later but i would start with something that kind of it's not add, add the add the overload that's but know, it's real, reliable more reliable. or something yeah. so what do you think it builds those other ones or uh, no this one is uh, this api is good and then we either add a like a helper that lets you grow this this buffer and maybe even do the loop or we just add a property saying like this is the you know expected buffer size that you should pass first like path dot max <laughs> no like no like path dot uh, guess what what they do right now is just use two sixty seven yeah. which is reasonable to you know that one of those we should still call it path dot max just for shit thinking of yeah, I mean, that seems reasonable. Um, I mean, Jeremy, why did you add the APIs? Because you needed them or just for consistency or did somebody ask for them? Um, well, we, we do need them, although, you know, getting back to that original point, we would, ha we would have internal ones. Because, like, we don't want to jump through that hoop either. We want something that takes value string builder. I see. Because like it's pointless for us to jump through that hoop, but it, the similar thing is there, and like we have this in the uh, in a lot of places where we're needing to uh, normalize. So about this, we approve the API as you propose it here, because as Christoph said, like okay, this is the minimum we have to provide, and it's not convenient, but it does the job. And then we do a separate review over the value stream build and see whether we can productize that as a as a, as a pattern. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to push that one forward. Um, uh, is, uh, is Steven still on? Yeah, I'm here. Are, are you interested in working on that, too? Uh, I can work with you, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, you have a lot to do with hey, emo. putting that together. Well, I've, I've seen your thing. I'm, I'm going to that next. But I have a question. Should the uh, primary yeah. names be consistent instead of path, destination, source destination? Did we discuss that? They they are they are cast, they're uh, consistent with the existing. Okay, gotcha. Ones. Okay. Um, so which one? With, with they're consistent with get full path and get relative path, get random file name, etc. Okay. Oh, I see. Uh, outside of the buffer, because there was no buffer on the other one, so I use destination, which is our. So I have a question about some of the parameter. Uh, sure. Uh, order. Why is path before the base path? Uh, because of the way the overloads are, we didn't want to flip them. Oh, you mean existing overload? Yeah, well, you see, get full path takes path, and that was the existing one, and then the new ones. It's just weird to have it flipped. Yeah. I mean, we can revisit that again, but... So get full path, path destination. Oh, it's a, it's a relative path, I see. Get full path from a relative path. The second one... Path, base path. The second one is not logically just an overload of the first one. It is. The basically. first one, well, they're, they're the same thing. Like what the one, is, the the overload one just basically does not use the current working directory. Yeah. Base path is the is your effective current working directory. Imagine the fir the first one calling the second one passing in current directory for base path. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's, okay. That 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 is essentially what it is. It's it's. It's filling in base path with get current directory. It's just the one where you pass the base path uh, explicitly. It's just a combine, correct? Uh, it's more complicated than that, but yeah, you can effectively think okay. of it as that. Because we we only combine them where you don't where you have to, and then the combine rules are pretty complicated on Windows. And try get relative path. Let me parse what it does. Relative to Path destination. You want to make a path is the full path, and the relative yep. to is basically a base. Yep. So, why, so how do you get to path from yeah. that other path? So why would we not call the parameter base path? So it's consistent with the. It's basically a reverse of the one that takes base path. Because we shipped it two versions ago. Oh, again, okay. The feedback would be helpful. <laughs> All right, well, I rest my case. All right, I'll
I'll follow up on the value string builder. That sounds good. All right, so I have pooped the API already, I think. I believe. Yeah. Oh. All right. There, there's a lot of discussion there because some community members want to contribute to why I pushed it. Yep, that seems reasonable. They're just trying to navigate the whole complexity of the cross. Right. Then if you move the other one, then also just inject it from the side if I can figure out how to do it. I mentioned the high DPI sucks when you have different monitors with different DPIs. Um, so the change at the very bottom, I didn't update the original post, but essentially treating arbitrary structs as bytes uh, could lead to unexpected behavior either crashes or things like that. And a simpler repro is if you use decimal on, on uh, full framework and you try to write uh, read arbitrary bytes into the decimal, it'll crash. So I'm, I'm confused. What, what does YAM mean by visibility checks in that context? So basically, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to make a union struct that is like a decimal and a, a fixed byte without going Basically, without saying, I am no longer verifiable code. It's it's verifiability, really. Also, if you have an internal, like a private field, and you decide to change that from a struct, and that you're sending it as as bytes, you could cause a breaking change by just changing the internal the private field or internal not internal private field. So okay. are you saying you construct a different type that matches the existing layout, and then it just casts one to the other, and this way it can read the contents? Is that what you're saying? Um, it, it's it's basically, structs like decimal aren't blittable, but this is treating them as if all structs are blittable. So this way I can basically extract arbitrary fields because I can just create something else and then blit, blit this into this representation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I agree I that we have a problem, but I would just change as bytes to read on this one. That doesn't solve visibility issues. Sure. And I mean, yeah. that, we don't care about verifi verifiability anyway going forward, so whatever. Um, like, it doesn't solve some of the issues. Like, which one? So, like, it just read, l lets you read memory. An example that um, Jan just mentioned to me is if you have a struct with a private int, yes, and you ca call as bytes on that struct, yes, and you pass it on the wire to uh, like to some uh, web server. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's worse. And then let's say you change it from a private int to a private int pointer. And okay. now your app could, uh, could crash because of uh, address randomization. But so first off, if you're doing that, you're going to fail security review anyway. So I, I'm not worried about that. OK. Um, but I mean, a customer who has this truck. But what is, say, say it again. How do you fail? Um, Basically, if you serialize an address on one machine, it's serialized on the other machine. And right oh. Okay, well, sure. Don't do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Honestly, like, if, to me, it's a bit weird to say, you know, if I can, I mean, I can do this today, right? I can I can stay on the .NET framework. I can just take an arbitrary object graph, go to binary formatter, and then I have a bunch of bytes, and I can read them, right? Like, they, they, they do serialize private state today. You, well. you have to skip verifiability checks to do that. No. Yeah, you do. No, the object itself writes the state. Uh, you can't do that outside of partial trust, which means by definition you're skipping verifiability checks. I'm still not following. If I if I form with an object yeah. and that object basically implements an interface, yes. it can it can serialize all its own private state and nobody skips anything because they have access to their own state. But then write this to memory stream and then I can just read the bytes afterwards. Nobody's stopping you. The interface, like the uh, the I serializable interface, the yeah. thing that's marked security critical. Yeah, but the, the, the object itself is writing that. Okay, the object yeah. itself can have a method foo yeah. that writes its internal state. Yeah, I mean that's 
grid dot two bytes, grid dot parse. Yeah. 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 But those objects are saying, I am explicitly blittable and I'm giving you an API that exposes my blittability. Sure. Right? Decimal does not have such an API. Uh, so, okay, so there's another one, which is uh, if we said, okay, we let's not do it for decimal. I would be, yeah. I, I'm also okay with it. What I would not want to happen suddenly, binary primitives, try read machine, and it doesn't work uh, if I want to read an int out of a span. And you have to use some memory marshal APIs to but do it. I think it's taking it too far. Primitive types. We have primitive all those, right? Try read, int, six, uh, yeah. uint 16, uint yeah. 32. Yeah, yeah. So those ones would work fine. It's only when t is struck. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I just why wanted to make sure. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. if we limit it to, you know, we remove the ability to do it for decimal or for for struct, it worries me a bit more. We should discuss it. But I, I was just saying, initially, when I read the proposal, I think some people proposed that we just like move all these APIs to memory marshal. Can and you I scroll think to the bottom? I, I think only the ones that allow you to, to skip visibility checks would make sense to move to memory marshal. But like none of the other binary primitives APIs would Yeah, so I listed out which APIs would change there. It would be this set. So okay, let's let's yeah. read. Yeah. So yeah. S bytes changes to read only span. Okay. Uh no, th those ones are getting removed, and they're oh. all moving down to interrupt services marshal memory marshal. The signature remains the same. Yeah. So you see, so what I would prefer is that. Yeah, we move we move we move as bytes that returns a span to memory marshal, but the one that returns read only span, we just leave it. I don't think that's a good idea. The reason being that if you're trying to blit a struct as arbitrary bytes, you're probably going to do the reverse operation at some point. So it doesn't make sense to have one on memory marshal and one not on memory marshal. Um so let me give you a scenario where I don't blit it back. Yeah. So uh, we have transformation interfaces, and uh, they all operate on bytes because they are typeless. They just transform bytes. Yeah. So if I have a sp span of chars and I want to transcode it to span of bytes, I need to use this one. Cast it to bytes and then it trans do the transformation. Span of char to span of byte is kind of a nonsensical conversion. Though. Why? It's UTF-16 with some arbitrary endianness. Uh, with we, we, the same, it's a reinterpret cast, so let, yes. Yeah, but if it's a reinterpret cast, it should be on memory marshal. Uh, why? Because it's a reinterpret cast. <laughs> so what? Reinterpret cast is by definition unsafe. Uh, how, why is it unsafe? Because it's a reinterpret cast. No, not from chars to bytes. I don't think it's un uh, like I don't know what's your definition of unsafe. Um, unsafe in the sense that you're taking the data and you're attempting to read it in a format that it was not intended to be read. Uh, read. I, I, th I think his point is like, general, as soon as you bit flip anything, right, you have to know what you're doing. Yeah. Which is basically what memory marshal is. It's literally a memory marshal. So you treat I don't know. One memory layout is a different memory layout. We're, we're not blocking any scenarios. Yeah. We're just moving APIs around. Yeah, I just think that we are taking it too far to a point where, like, we can keep going. Like, all APIs can be misused. Would the solution be then have primitive overloads for S-bytes that are on uh, memory extensions rather than of T? And then the of T, we just move memory marshal, similar to, let's say, we have for read, on, read machine Indian. It just complicates API. Now we need to have S bytes that you know from all spans of all ints. Like, are we really buying anything? I I think we are going too far. Okay, well we are just complicating API and like. What your too far argument is because basically all you have to change is the the class name, right? So you basically you know the exact same thing, the exact number of 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 types. It's just instead of doing memory extensions dot blah, you say yeah. Memory. We just made the API. Uh, more difficult to use. You cannot use uh, use it as an as an extension, and I don't know what we are getting in in return. We're we're basically saying anything that we think developers have the potential to shoot themselves with, we're going to move off to another uh, another class. And this API, yeah. And we have many APIs in the framework where developers can shoot themselves in the foot. Well, yes, and, and we're, we're, and we're, we're trying, to memory we're trying to audit them and move them where we can. 
No, but the but 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 the argument goes the other way around as yeah. well, right? Which is so let's say let's say I buy your argument yeah. that this is a this is something you need to think about. The downside with pushing everybody to memory marshal is that on memory marshal you also have APIs that have a quite large continuum from potentially unsafe to holy shit this is probably extremely unsafe, right? right. So if you point them to one time, exactly. where That's everybody's a, in the I, same bucket, yeah. you may make it worse because now you expose them to more unsafe I, stuff. I yeah. argue that the people who are doing reinterpret casts are already probably using memory marshal anyway. Well, I mean, his code today doesn't, right? So that will be a counter argument. And I'm curious as to whether, like, as to whether your code is even correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, find code that is not correct, and then we talk, talk, talk. Uh, quickly. Like, you're a shitty coder. No, it, it's not that. It's like you, you, you just can't arbitrarily go from char to byte, for instance, without, with, without special casing your platform, for example. Like, what? I don't even know what that conversion. Even like you can't send those bytes across a wire anywhere. Like, sure. I mean, I, I suppose you can, but now you have to tell the person on the other side, this is UTF-16, maybe big Endian, maybe little Endian, blah, 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 blah. Like, I hope you had a byte order mark on there somewhere. Sure. I mean, now you're talking like we're going from a very simple operation that is very clear what it does, and it's super safe, well, it's so safe, but what, what, I, what I'm trying to argue is you probably used it incorrectly because we made it too visible. We have so many APIs. You can use them so incorrectly. That's not the bar That's for memory marshal. That's not to make new APIs. That's not the reason for memory marshal. Memory marshal was meant to be for unsafe APIs, not for APIs that you can misuse. Well, I think misuse... What's the difference? I think, I think, I think we should separate misuse from, like, the API is very context sensitive. Right. So, for example, I can, you know, GC collect, right, is an API, you know, you should use sparingly because if you don't, then bad things might happen, right? But, like, if you if you use it incorrectly, what's the worst that can happen? Your shit just runs slower, mm -hmm. right? Those guys, when you do it incorrectly, well, you know, depending on what things you reinterpreted, it might actually be pretty bad. No, it's, uh, you have to, this one always works and there's nothing wrong with it. What you do with this data, sure... Uh, but we have already APIs. We have encoders in, uh, you know, in uh, not. An, uh, we have basically APIs that produce byte arrays. Right. Okay, now if you send the byte array and you know, like you put the uh, the bytes in wrong order and send it over the wire, you're gonna have problems. Sure, no, like the, the API name explicitly says, like I am converting from UTF-8 to like UTF-16 big Indian. Like it's actually part of the API name. Like if you do that and then send the bytes to somebody who's not expecting it, like, that's on you as a developer. Yeah, same here. I it's on you if you so just so take like, the... But, but, uh, what's your, what, what do you think the T's are? Because let's say yeah. you have a read-only span of my fancy span, right? But that somebody authored, right? Yeah. Now you can get, essentially, the raw bytes. Yes. And I can now do whatever I want with them. Right? Exactly. And so, like, the, so the thing is, you're effectively doing the equivalent of a memory walk. And just buy the correct. Thing, correct. Which, you know, we have on Donald Framework disabled private reflection at least in, in store because people misuse it all the time and like to, to, to get access to private yeah. state, right? Now, when you combine these, th so, the, so the problem is each of those APIs <coughs> is fine. It's like the sequence of this one followed by read machine and you yeah. basically lit one struct to a different struct where you just mark, mark all fields public and all of a sudden you can read arbitrary fields. So, how, how about this? Which is what people have done in the if we can say, read uh, if we can say as bytes of t on every single architecture on every single fitness returns the exact same blittable representation, I'll be willing to let it slide. But if you have a .NET application on machine A that calls as bytes, and a .NET application on machine B that, given the exact same t, calls as bytes, and they return different things, like that sounds dangerous to me. So you, you don't even care about the visibility, you care about that the, that the byte layout may be different and that causes bad things to happen. As an example, yeah. Well, the, uh, the, uh, the compromise that you propose is not doable. But what's the point so of like calling as bytes if you're not going to like transmit it somewhere or do something? Like, why, why call it? Well, you might just do it like, in memory, right? Yeah, but, but like, presume, presume, 
Presumably you're not calling it for fun. Presumably you're calling to, it to use our components. transformations. To use our transformations. Well, in this case, for example, you want to do it on the same machine. You want to, you want to transcode from one representation to the other, what? but it stays on the same. But well, let's say you have index of You want to do some operation. Yeah. You call as bytes and you do the operation. You don't care about the bytes in themselves. You just care about the result, which is the what index you found the values at. Yeah, but index of we already have an implementation. Um, sure. Yeah. But as an example, that that's where something you could use as. Yeah, but in index of uses unsaved code and numbers. Right. Like that's already a special case. Easy. Already you already call it. But I think the question is if you. I, I think your argument with first party versus third party, like you can apply it for anything you do at this point. Like that's sure. that's the unfortunate thing. I mean, like the the one thing we we do with span is basically to push the envelope on, like how far you can go without actually doing like you know pointer. And I'm I'm totally fine with enabling the scenario. I just I don't want to have that in the query. I, I don't want to expose it as something we lead people to doing unless like they know we're not holding your hand here. Especially if it's an extension method, which yeah. in this case which is yeah. Yeah. So another thing okay, so another uh, proposed fix. I I would be fine if we move it to binary primitives. Right. Because basically it's the same thing. It's like there are many APIs there that you need to know what you're doing with NDNS. And, and in the name we could say as machine NDNS bytes. I'm fine with that too. It makes it very clear that it is just giving you the it's bytes. It's not in the just that, it's also fitness. Like if I have a 32-bit app and a 64-bit app on the exact same machine, they might still return different data when I call as bytes of T. Uh, you mean for structs that um, Maybe uh, my struct have, have, have padding and stuff yeah. like this? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 So but that's that's what I mean by it's, it sounds like it's Okay, so yet another uh, uh, tweak. Before I mentioned that I would not be happy if we add as, as bytes for each primitive type to memory extensions because I feel like suddenly like we are adding thousands and thousands of overloads. But binary primitive, it already has uh, this done yes. uh, for the very same reason. So again, if we move these APIs to binary primitives and make them work just on the primitives, I, I think it's fine. Well, you, then I think we're leaving the room. We're losing the room. Yeah. So like, I think this is something we should probably discuss more. One of the reasons it was done like, like that on binary primitives is because you need to be able to swap the uh, evidence. Uh,